The Cube presents Ignite 22. Brought to you by Palo Alto Networks. Hey guys and girls, welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Palo Alto Ignite 22. We're live at the MGM Grand Hotel in beautiful Las Vegas. Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante. This is day one of our coverage. We've been talking with execs from Palo Alto, partners, but one of our most exciting things is talking with founders, Dave. We get to do that next. You know, the thing is, it's like I wrote this weekend in my breaking analysis, understanding the problem in cybersecurity is really easy, but figuring out how to fix it, Ain't so much, so it definitely excited isn't. to have Nir here. Very excited, Nir Zook joins us, the founder and CTO of Palo Alto Networks. Welcome Nir, great to have you on the program. Thank you. So Palo Alto Networks, you founded it back in 2005, it's hard to believe that's been 18 years, almost. You did something different, which I want to get into, but tell us what was it back then, why did you found this company? I thought the world needed another cybersecurity company. I wasn't worried enough. <laughs> no, yeah. no, I thought it's because there were so many cybersecurity vendors in the world and it just didn't make any sense. This industry has evolved in a very weird way where every time there was a new challenge, rather than existing vendors dealing with a challenge, you had new vendors dealing with it and I thought uh, I could put a stop to it and, and I think I did. You did something differently back in 2005, looking at where you are now the leader, what was different in your mind back then? Yeah, so you know, when you found a new company, you have really two good options. There's also a bad option, but we'll skip that. You can either disrupt an existing market or you can create a new market. So first, I decided to disrupt an existing market, go into an existing market, first network security, then cyber security, and, and change it, change the way it works. And like I said, the, the challenge is that every problem had a new vendor, and nobody just stepped back and said, I think I can solve it with a platform. Meaning I can think I can spend some time not solving a specific problem, but building a platform that then can be used to solve many different problems. And, and that's what I've done, and that's what Palo Alto Networks has done, and that's where we are today. So you look back, you, you call it now, I think you call it a next-gen firewall, but nothing in 2005 can be, can it be next-gen? But you know the Silicon Valley show, you know the show Silicon Valley? Oh yeah, yeah of course. You got to have a box, yes. right? But it was a different kind of box. I, actually, Explain it's, that. it's exactly the same thing. You, yeah. you got to have a box. So I actually wanted to call it a necessary evil. <laughs> yeah. uh, marketing wouldn't go for that. No. And, and the reason I wanted to call it a necessary evil because one of the things that we've done in order to platformize cybersecurity, again, first network security now, also cloud security and security operations, is to turn it into a SaaS delivered industry. You know, today, every cybersecurity professional knows that when they buy cybersecurity, they buy usually a SaaS delivered service. Back then, people thought I was crazy to think that customers are going to send their data to their vendor in order to process, and they wanted everything on premise and so on. And so, but I said, no, customers are going to send information to us for processing because we have much more processing power than they have. And, and, and we needed something in the infrastructure to send us the information. So that's why I wanted to call it the necessary evil. We ended up calling it next generation firewall, which was probably a better term. Well, even, even Veritas, remember Veritas, they had the no hardware agenda. Even they have a box. So you got, it's yeah. like you say, you got to have it. It's a necessary <laughs> evil. Um, okay, so, but this, you did this, you started this in your own cloud, kind of like Salesforce, ServiceNow, Correct. similar. Now in you, our own data centers. In your own data yes. center, okay. I call it a cloud, but no. Yeah, no, it's the same. Yeah. You know, there's no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> According to Larry Ellison, he was actually probably right about that. <laughs> so, but over time, you've had this closer partnership with, with the public clouds. Correct. What, what does that bring you and your customers? And how hard was that to navigate? Uh, it wasn't that hard for us because we didn't have that many services. Usually it's harder. Uh, of course, we didn't do a lift and shift, which, which is the wrong thing to do with the cloud. We rebuilt things for the cloud. And uh, the benefits, of course, are time to market, scale, agility, and in some cases also cost. In yeah, some cases. In some cases. So you have a sort of a, 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 a hybrid model today, right? You could still um, run your own data centers, do you not? Or? Very few. Really? Okay. There are very, very few things that we have to do on hardware, like simulating malware and things that cannot be done in a virtual machine, which is pretty much the only option you have in the cloud. You know, they, they provide bare, bare metal, but doesn't serve our needs. I think that uh, 
we don't view cloud and your viewers should not be viewing cloud as a place where they're going to save money. It's a place where they're going to make money. I like you know, that. You make much more money yeah. because you're more agile. And that's why you know, this conversation about, oh, your, your cost of goods sold are going to be so high, you're going to have to come back to your own data centers. That's not on your mind right now. You're, what's on your mind is advancing the unit. Right? Yeah, look, the da my own data center would limit me in scale, would limit my agility. You know, if you want to build something new, you don't have all the PaaS services, the platform as a service services like that database and, and AI and so on. I have to build them myself, so it takes time. So yeah, it's going to be cheaper. But I'm not going to be delivering the same thing, so my revenues will be much lower. Less top line. What can humans do better than machines? You were talking in your keynote, I'm just going to chat a little bit. You were talking about your keynote, basically if you guys didn't see the keynote, yeah. that AI is going to run every SOC within five years. That was a great prediction that you Correct. made. And they're going to do things that you can't do today, and then in the future they're going to do things that you can't, you, that, that better than you can do. And you just have to be comfortable with that. No. So what, what do you think humans can do today and in the future better than machines? Look, humans can always do better than machines. The human mind can do things that machines cannot do. Like, we're conscious. I don't think machines will be conscious. And you can do things, uh, but my point was not that machines can do things that humans cannot do. They can just do it better. The things that humans do today, machines can do better. Once machines do that, humans will be free to do things that they don't do today, that machines cannot do. Like what? Like finding the most difficult, most covert attacks, uh, dealing with the most difficult uh, incidents, things that machines just can't do. It's just that today, humans are consumed by finding attacks that machines can find, by dealing with incidents that machines can deal with. It's a waste of time. Leave it to the machines and go and focus on the most difficult problems. And then have the machines learn from you so that next time or a hundred or a thousand times from now they can do it themselves and you focus on the even more difficult. Yeah, it's like after 9-11 they said that we, we lack the creativity. That's what humans have that yeah. machines don't, at least today. So. Machines don't, yeah, I, I, look. Uh, Every airplane has two pilots, even though airplanes have been flying themselves for 30 years now. Why do you have two pilots? To do the things that machines cannot do, like land on the Hudson, right? You yeah. always need humans to do the things that machines cannot do. But leave the things that machines can do to the machines, they'll do it better. And autonomous vehicles need brakes. <laughs> Zia Caravala. Are, where are, in your customer conversations, are customers really grappling with that? Or are they going, yeah, you're, you're right? No. It depends. You know, it's, it's hard for customers to let go of old habits. First, the habit of buying 100 different solutions from 100 different vendors and, you know, what, why would I trust one vendor to do everything, put all my eggs in the same basket, and say, uh, they have all kinds of slogans as to why not to do that, even though it's been proven again and again that doing everything in one system with one brain versus 100 systems with 100 brains work much better. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is we always have the same issue that we've had, I think, since the Industrial Revolution of what, machines are going to take away my job? Yeah. No, they're just going to make your job better. So I think that some of our customers are also grappling with that. Like, what, what do I do if the machines take over? And, and of course, like we've said, the machines aren't taking over. They're going to do the benign work. You're going to do the interesting work. You should embrace it. When I think about the, your history as a, as a technology pro, uh, from Checkpoint, a couple of startups. One of the things that always frustrated you is when, when a larger company bought you out, you ended up getting sucked into the bureauc bureaucratic vortex. How do you avoid that at, at Palo Alto Networks? So first, uh, you mean when we acquire a company? Yes. So the, the first thing is that when we acquire companies, we always acquire for integration. Meaning we, we don't just buy something and then leave it on the side and try to sell it here and there. We integrate it into the core of our products. So that's very important, so that the technology lives, thrives, and, and continues to grow as part of our bigger platform. And I think that the second thing that is very important is, from past experience, what we've learned, is to put the people that we acquire in key positions. Meaning you don't buy a company and then put the leader of that company five levels below the CEO. You know, you always put them in very senior positions, almost always 
we, we have the leaders of the companies that we acquire be two levels below the CEO, so very senior in the company, so they can influence and make changes. So two questions related to that. Um, one is, can you, as you grow your TAM, can you, can you be both integrated and, second part of the question, well, can you be both integrated and best of breed? Second part of the question is, do you even have to be? So I'll answer it in the third way, which is I don't think you can be best of breed without being integrated in cybersecurity. And the reason is, again, this split brain that I've mentioned twice. When you have different products do a part of cybersecurity and they don't talk to each other and they don't share a single brain, you always compromise. You, know, you start looking for things the wrong way. I, I can be a little bit technical here, but Please. You know, yeah, take no. the example of, you know, traditionally you would buy an IDS IPS separately from URL filtering, separately from DNS security. There is, w w w one of the most important things we do in network security is to find command and control connections. Command and control connections where the adversary is controlling something behind your firewall and, and is now going around your network is usually the Achilles heel of the attack. That's why attacks like ransomware that don't have a command and control connection are so difficult to deal with, by the way. So command and control connections are the Achilles heel of the attacks, and there are three different technologies that deal with it. URL filtering for URL-based command and control, DNS security for DNS-based command and control, and IDS IPS for general command and control. If those are three different products, they'll be doing the wrong things. You know, the URL filter will try to find things that it's not really good at, that the IPS really need to find, and the DN it doesn't work. It works much better when it's one product doing everything. So I think the choice is not between best of breed and integrated. I think the only choice is integrated because that's the only way to be best of breed. And, and behind that technology is some kind of real-time data store, I'll call it, data lake, database, yeah, whatever. It's all driven by the same data. All the URLs series, and all the domain graph names database. and all the, everything goes to one big data lake. Uh, we collect about, I think we collect about two, two hundred, close to a, peta, a few petabytes per day. I don't remember the exact number of data. It's all going to the same data lake and all the intelligence is driven by, by that. Mm. So you mentioned uh, in a cheeky comment about when you, why you founded the company, there weren't enough cybersecurity companies. Yeah. Clearly, the TAM expansion st strategy that Palo Alto Networks has done has been very successful. You've been, as you talked about, very focused on integration, not just from the technology perspective, but from the people perspective as well. Correct. So why are there still so many cybersecurity companies, and what, can, what are you thinking Palo Alto Networks can do to change that? So, uh, first, I think that there are a lot of cybersecurity companies out there because there's a lot of money going into cybersecurity. If you look at the number of companies that have been really successful, it's a small, very small percentage of those cybersecurity companies. And, and also, look, we, we're not going to be responsible for all the innovation in cybersecurity. We need other people to innovate. It's also, look, there's always the question is, do you buy something or do you build it yourself? Right. Now, we, we think we're the smartest people in the world. Of course, we can build everything. But uh, it's not always true that we can build everything, not that we're the, we're the smartest people in the world, for sure. <laughs> you see, when, when you're a startup, you live and die by the thing that you build. Meaning, if it's good, it works. If it's not good, you die. You, you run out of money, you shut down, and you just lost four years of your life. To, to this. At least. At least. <laughs> when, when you're a large company, yeah, I can go and find 100 engineers and hire them, and especially nowadays it becomes easier, as it become, became easier, and, and, and give them money and, and have them go and build the same thing that the startup is building, but they're part of a bigger company and you know, they'll have more coffee breaks and, and they'll be less incented to, to go and do that because the company will survive with or without them. So that's why startups can do things much better sometimes than larger companies. Yeah. We can do things better than startups when it comes to being data driven because we have the data and nobody can compete against the amount of data that we have. So we have a good combination of finding the right startups that have already built something, already proven that it works with some customers and, uh, and, and of course building a lot of things internally that we cannot do outside. I heard you say in one of the I don't know, dozens of videos I've, I've listened to you uh, talk to that 
the industry doesn't need or doesn't want another IoT stovepipe. Okay, I agree. So you got on-prem, AWS, Azure, Google, maybe Alibaba, IoT is going to be all over the place. So can you build, I call it the security super cloud. In other words, a consistent experience with the same policies and edicts across all my estates, irrespective of physical location. Is that technically feasible? Is it, is it what you're trying to do? Certainly what we're trying to do with Prisma Cloud, with our cloud security product, uh, it works across all the clouds that you mentioned and Oracle as well. And uh, it's, it's almost entirely possible. Almost. Almost, uh, well, the, yeah. the thing is that what you do is you normalize the language Right. that the different cloud scale providers use into one language. So you know, this, this cloud calls it uh, S3, and, and uh, so IAWS calls it S3, and Azure Google Blob calls it whatever, GCS, yeah. and, 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 and so on. So you normalize their terminology, and, and then build policy using a common terminology that your customers have to get used to. Of course, there are things that are different between the different cloud providers that cannot be normalized, and there, yeah, it has to be cloud specific. And, and in, in that instance, so is that your, in part your strategy is of to course. actually build that? And, and does that necessitate uh, running on all the major clouds? Of course, that yeah. it's not just part of our strategy, it's a major part of our it's, strategy. It's, uh, compulsory. That Look, as, as a standalone vendor that is not a cloud provider, we, we have two advantages. The first one is we're security product, uh, security focused. Yep. So we can do much better than them when it comes to security. You know, if you're a AWS, GCP, Azure, and so on, you're not going to put your best people on security. You're going to put them on the core business that you have. So we can do much better. <laughs> hey, that's interesting. The way it works. Well, that's not how they talk. I know but that's okay. not how they talk. Yeah. But no, but that's interesting. Look, you when say something that. is four percent of your business, you're not going to put it. You're not going to put your best people there. It's just why would you? Yeah. You put your best people on ninety-six percent. Yeah, it's not driving their revenue. I, I, right. Mm. Uh, look, it's simple. Yeah. Uh, it's not what they With say. all due respect. I I, With yeah, all due yeah, respect. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think we do security much better than them, and, and they become the good enough, and, and, and we become the premium. But certainly the second thing that gives us an advantage and the right to be a standalone security provider is that we're multi-cloud. Private cloud and all the major cloud providers. But, but they also have a different role. I mean, you, your, your role is not the secure, the nitro card or the graviton chip, or, or is it? Uh, they are responsible for securing yeah. uh, up to the operating system. We secure everything. And they do a pretty good job of that. No, they do. Yeah. Certainly, they have to. You know, if they get breached <laughs> right. at that level, it's it, not just that one customer is going to suffer. Yeah, the entire know. customer base. Yeah, yeah. So, so. yeah, I'm, uh, they, they, yeah, they have to spend a lot of time and money on it. And frankly, that's where they put their best security people. Yeah, right. Securing the infrastructure, not building some cloud security feature. Absolutely. Yeah. So Palo Alto Networks is, as we wrap here, on track to double, nearly double its revenues to nearly seven billion in FY23, just compared to 2020. You were quoted in the press by saying, we will be the first $100 billion cyber company. What is next for Palo Alto to achieve that? Yeah, so it was Nikesh, our, our CEO oh, Nikesh, and okay. chairman, that was quoted saying that uh, we will double to 100 billion. I don't think he gave a time frame, but uh, what it takes is to double the sales, right? We're at 50 billion market cap right now. So we need to double sales, but you know, in, in reality, you, know, you mentioned that we're growing the town by doing more and more cybersecurity functions and taking away pieces. Uh, still, we, we, we have a relatively small, even though we're the largest cybersecurity vendor in the world, we have a very low market share, Tiny. which shows right. you how fragmented the market is. I would also like to point out something that is less known. Part of what we do with AI is really take the part of the cybersecurity industry which are service oriented, and that's about 50% of the cybersecurity industry, services, mm -hmm. and turn it into products. I mean, not all of it, right. but a good portion of what's provided today by people, mm -hmm. and tens of billions of dollars are spent on that, can be done with products, and being one of the very, very few vendors that do that, I think we have a huge opportunity at turning those tens of billions of dollars in human services to AI. It's always been a good business, taking human labor and translating into R&D, vendor R&D. Especially. It never fails if you do it well. Especially in difficult times, difficult economical times, like we are probably yeah. experiencing right now as a 
no, around the world. We, not we, but yeah. we, right. the world. Right. Right. <laughs> well, congratulations, coming up on the 18th anniversary, tremendous amount of success. Thank Great you. vision, clear vision, STEM expansion strategy, really well underway. We are definitely going to continue to keep our eyes. Big company, 100 billion, that's market cap, let's say. That's a big company. You said you didn't want to work for a big company, unless you founded it, is that the? Unless it acts like a small company. Ah, ah yeah. there's <laughs> the caveat. We'll keep our okay. eye on Okay, thank you very much. It's been such Thanks. a pleasure having you yeah. on, thank Same you. Same here, thank you. All right, for our guest and for Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live emerging and enterprise tech coverage.